Okay, let me go on to something else then, which is another approach for improving our ability to image quickly that is really a totally different take on how we can potentially accelerate our imaging. And this approach is something called parallel imaging. Now, parallel imaging, which there may not be specific notes in there on this, my apologies. Um, parallel imaging goes by a bunch of different names, right? Sense, <coughs> Smash, um, Grappa, and there are others. These techniques are not all exactly the same, uh, but given the amount of time that we have available, I, I just want to basically touch on the overall concept of what we do in parallel imaging and show you some examples of how it can be used and especially some specific issues related to artifacts that occur in parallel imaging. So we already know from thinking about fast spin echo imaging that one of the potential ways that we can accelerate our imaging would be to acquire many lines of case space at once. Right? Our raw data, right, case space, requires that we fill it up with so many lines of data and all of those repetitions of the imaging pulse sequence are going to take time. So one of the things we discussed was if we could in a single TR acquire a bunch of those lines at once, that would dramatically decrease the number of repetitions that would be required and would improve our imaging time. So the bottom line is that the approach in parallel imaging is also to enhance our efficiency in filling case space. But it's not done by increasing how many lines we acquire at once. It's done by decreasing the number of lines that we acquire. Which may sound a little bit strange. But basically we know that all of these lines of case space must be acquired in order to give us enough information using our phase encoding approach to localize signal along the phase encoding direction. That it's the Fourier transform comparing all of those different signals that were acquired that allows it to separate that signal in space. What happens <coughs> if we have our patient here and well, let's look at this differently. What happens if we have our image And we want to acquire an image. Let's say this is some transverse image of the abdomen. And let's assume that this is our phase encoding direction, top to bottom. So if we're interested in an image that will have a resolution of 256 in that direction, then we need 256 different samples, 256 lines of K-space. What's going to happen if we do not have 256 lines? What if we only have half of that? What if we only acquire 128 lines of case space? We're going to lose what? Which area? I'm sorry? Well, we'll be losing those lines, that's true, but my point is that each time we acquire one of these lines of case space, that's a signal that contains information from the entire image. Okay? Now we know that in order for us to correctly sample all of the signal in this image, that we need to have a sampling frequency that is adequate for the range of spatial frequencies in the image. And if not, we're going to have aliasing. 
So by acquiring an insufficient number of lines of case space, an insufficient number of samples for the size of this image, we are essentially going to be undersampling the signal in the image. Right? If we acquire half as many lines, it's essentially as if we're saying, well, we're really only interested in sampling half the spatial extent of the image. And we will end up with something that looks like this, with significant aliasing in the image. We're really just undersampling our signal. This is what is done in parallel imaging, but there is a difference. So in the parallel imaging approach, we image with let's say for our purposes, a pair of coils. And we've talked about using multiple coils in a phased array or quadrature coil before. In, this, in those cases, the signal from those two coils, in the quadrature coil for example, were out of phase by 90 degrees. And before we ever got to the point of placing the data that we acquire into case space, those two signals were combined together. So that each time we filled in a line of case space, it contained information combined from both of those coils. The difference in parallel imaging is that we actually acquire each of those signals completely independently. And we'll place each of those signals into a separate sheet of case space. So after we do our imaging and we fill up each of these two sheets of case space, what we have is two images which are both undersampled and therefore have significant amounts of aliasing. Okay. There's one more piece of information that we need to be aware of. Since we're acquiring the signal from those two coils independently, it's possible for us to figure out that this coil is more sensitive to things that are on this bottom half of the image. This coil up here is more sensitive to things that are present on the top half of the image. And there are actually ways to map out the coil sensitivity so we know at every point in the image what is the relative sensitivity of each coil element to signal arising at that location. So we have two images, right, each of the whole body part, which are aliased because of that undersampling. But we have, with each of these images, information about the coil sensitivity. So these images, first of all, were each acquired with a separate coil. They don't look exactly the same. They will have different gradients of signal amplitude. The one acquired with this coil down here, let's say it's this one, is going to have much higher amplitude lower down than it does higher up. And vice versa, right, for this one up here. So with the knowledge of what the coil sensitivity is, and this is done, by the way, by acquiring a large field of view, higher resolution image, right, that doesn't take very long to acquire, and actually mapping out the sensitivity of the coil. So we know on a pixel by pixel basis exactly what the sensitivity of each of these coils is. We can use that coil sensitivity information to look at the aliased part of the image and say, okay, this pixel right here contains aliasing. That means it includes a summation of signal that comes from this actual location in the whole body part, as well as some amount that's aliased from the other side of the image. Right? That sum of that signal, we're able to separate into components that belong into two separate places based on our knowledge about the coil sensitivity.
So basically, this becomes a system of linear equations based on the coil sensitivities that we understand right, from our hardware and can be applied to the alias signal in the image. What that allows us to do is to combine these together and generate a single image which we have, so to speak, unfolded. Right, we've taken that aliasing and resolved it using our knowledge about coil sensitivity. Now, there's one important issue, well, a couple of things to be concerned about. First of all, in terms of this issue of aliasing, it's always important whenever you're doing parallel imaging to be very careful that the field of view which you specify includes the entire body part. If we specify a field of view that includes right, the whole area of the slice, there will still be aliasing because we're not having a sufficient number of samples. The problem is, if we would instead, let's say, specify only a fraction of this field of view, well, the field of view that we specify will still, of course, have aliasing because we are acquiring fewer lines of case space and undersampling the part of the image that we're interested in. The problem is that there's also this tissue out here which we haven't even accounted for, which will create additional aliasing in the image. And that aliasing, this approach is not able to deal with. So it's very important when you set up a sense or a parallel imaging acquisition that you expand your field of view so that it encompasses all of the tissue. And if not, we will get very specific aliasing artifacts which are a little bit different than the typical type of wraparound or aliasing and, and I'll show you some examples of that. That's one. The second is, the big advantage here is that we are able to image much faster. Okay. If we have two separate coil elements, then we can reduce the number of lines of case space that we acquire by a factor of two. If we had four, right, we could reduce it by a factor of four. Now there are some complications here in terms of the way these coil elements are arrayed along the patient. It's not, it doesn't necessarily work that every element in your coil can be used simultaneously for this type of acceleration. But what limits the amount of acceleration that we can apply is the fact that we need a coil with separate elements within that coil. And each of those coils has to run through an entirely separate processing stream. Right? The signal in a phased array coil is brought together before right, it ever gets through the receiver process. It all goes to the same sheet of case space. These signals have to be processed entirely independently. So you need a scanner which has the hardware to be able to do that. There needs to be a coil with multiple elements where each of those elements is brought out independently and fed to a separate receiver channel in the scanner. All this stuff is expensive and costs money. The number of channels that your scanner potentially has will determine the coils that you can use and the number of elements in those coils which all determine the amount of acceleration that you can achieve. So at Montefiore we have systems that are 8 channel and 16 channel. The one being installed downstairs is 32 channel. So with the right coil you could potentially have these tremendous degrees of acceleration. With that acceleration it means that we are acquiring fewer and fewer lines of case space and that the amplitudes of those phase encoding gradients as a result are lower. What that means is that the magnitude of the dephasing that occurs with each of the phase encoding gradients is less than it would be if we were acquiring all of the lines of case space. If we think about a typical image where we have 256 lines of case space, no parallel imaging, we have some very low amplitude phase encoding gradients applied in the center of case space.
and they get increasingly higher as we get to the periphery. Those ones at the periphery cause a tremendous amount of dephasing of the signal. That's why when we looked at K-space, it looked so dark in the periphery. In parallel imaging, we're only acquiring a few lines. Those lines are acquired at much lower amplitudes of this phase encoding gradient, and there isn't as much dephasing which means that these images will be much less sensitive to issues related to signal loss due to dephasing. So in terms of the you know, advantages here, one of them is speed, right? and one of them is our sensitivity to these signal loss pro problems related to the dephasing of the gradient magnetic fields. But at the same time, the thing you have to realize is that this is not for free. If we are acquiring fewer lines of K-space, it means exactly that. We're putting less signal into K-space. And even though we can unwrap these aliased images, the bottom line is we are simply acquiring less signal that ultimately goes into our image. So these are inherently going to be lower signal-to-noise images. And the more acceleration you apply, meaning the fewer lines of K-space you acquire, the worse this effect on signal-to-noise is going to be. Now, at lower magnetic field strengths, at one and a half Tesla, this can be a significant problem. At high field strength, at 3T, at 7T, there's a tremendously greater amount of inherent signal in the tissue to start with. So perhaps we can afford to give up some of this signal to noise ratio and that's where this might have its, its greatest advantage. So let me show you So this is a a cartoon that I made up with some images that were provided to me by Philips Medical Systems. And what we have here is a phantom image. This is what the phantom actually looks like. It's a bottle that has a bunch of different contrast agents in it, contrast elements in it. And we image this with two coils. Right? So those coils have a different spatial sensitivity. They're going to be most sensitive right underneath the area where they are. And we can actually generate an image, which is what I'm showing you over here, which is a map of the sensitivity of those coils. If we acquire our image at each coil with only a segment of the number of lines of K-space that would actually be acquired to get a full resolution image of this object, we end up with these two images which have a large degree of aliasing. Right, you can see here that the piece from the top is aliased to the bottom and the bottom to the top. So if we look at the areas where there is aliasing, we can take this piece of signal and say that we know that some of it comes from that actual location in the image. Some of it, on the other hand, comes from aliasing from the other side. And with the knowledge of this coil sensitivity, we can split that signal into the components and place them in the right location. So essentially, we take these two aliased images, combine them together, which is why the final image has better signal to noise than the components, and we're able to unfold that aliasing. In this case, with two coil elements, cutting the imaging time in half. Now, this is the issue with artifacts. So here are two coronal images of the abdomen. And these were given to me by Ken Kane at Phillips, where this normal volunteer is lying in the scanner on the left and the right. And on your left-hand side, we see this large artifact running up and down the center of the image. This scan was done immediately afterward, and it's gone. So the difference is that if you notice in the image on your right, we can see the complete contour 
of the lateral surface of the abdomen on both sides. Notice in this image on your left, there is this straight line over here. Right, we seem to be cutting something off. In the image on your left hand side, the patient was lying in the scanner with their arms at their sides. And the field of view that was appropriate for the abdomen is what was prescribed. But there was all this tissue in the arms that was outside of that field of view. And it is aliased into the center of the image. Okay. On the right, the patient simply put their arms up over their heads. The scan was repeated and the aliasing artifact goes away because that tissue is no longer there. The key salient difference, right, maybe I would put this in if I was writing a physics question for the boards. With, with parallel imaging, what's unique about the aliasing relative to the type of aliasing that we get when we undersample our field of view in a, in a conventional image? It's in the center of the image, exactly right. So we would otherwise expect that stuff to alias from one side of the image to the other at the edge, but in sense, it's in the center. All right, so here are three images which are all performed right, using sense. These are the acceleration factors, these P factors. And you can see these unanatomically straight edges at the top and the bottom. Right, this is the phase encoding direction top to bottom. So the specified field of view was too small. There's tissue outside of that field of view which is being aliased into the image. As we increase the acceleration factor, the artifact progressively moves toward the center of the image until you get this. They call this the kissing lips artifact, actually. Right, so here they're spread out closer together and then converge together in the midline. If you want to avoid this artifact, you simply make sure that your field of view is big enough at the outset. 